Ladies and gentlemen, you welcome to this edition of the Prime Time Newscast on Equinox Television, live from my headquarters in Cameroon's economic capital. Dweller with me, Pablo Jonathan, in our top stories in this edition of the news. A man allegedly kills his wife and baby in Sancho, in the west region of the Republic of Cameroon. And the council of stage a walk out of a council session in Kumba 2 subdivision in protest to over seven months of unpaid salaries like other councils in the two anglophone regions of the republic of cameroon badly affected by the deepening anglophone crisis the kumba 2 council is now depending on government subvention to survive Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us in this edition of the news. We begin with this human interest story streaming into our newsroom from the west region of the Republic of Cameroon. A man is said to have killed his wife and baby, and the incident occurred in Sancho. We have details with Smanjik and Gebre. Women in Sancho subdivision, manual division of the west region of Cameroon, mourning the decapitation of a nursing mother and her child by the husband who, after committing the unscrupulous act, took away his own life. In the morning, they sent the older children to school. We thought they had gone to the farm after that because the doors were closed. The children returned from school at 1 p.m. and the door was still locked. We asked the children to stay with us while waiting for their parents to come back from the farm. We waited up to 6 p.m. but they didn't return. They have the attitude of always informing they are going out. But that was not the case that fateful day. The children slept with us and in the morning we asked them to go verify if their parents were back. But the check was negative. At about 3 p.m. we dialed their numbers, but the lines were not accessible. We then decided to check if they had locked the door from inside or outside. With the aid of elderly ones in the quarter, at about 7 p.m. we discovered the door was locked inside. We then passed through the window and discovered their corpses on the floor with the wife and child decapitated. We decided only security authorities should touch the door. They arrived and gave us the go ahead for it to be opened. <laughs> The deceased husband in his 50s, according to sources, had ordered his first and second wives to pack out. He went for a third wife who bore him two kids, pregnant for the third. The husband asked her to abort. <laughs> this neighbor testifies. She was at home with her mother when the deceased woman came complaining to her the hell she was in. On their part, they advised the woman to keep the three months pregnancy and to leave the house as requested by her husband. <laughs> Living a solitary life, the man, after a long while, went back for his two children and wife. No one could imagine what seeds was being sown. The man had voluntarily returned money contributed in a local group to his members, saying he does not want to depart from this world with it. That he had made statements saying he was not sure he will see the next day. He had also kept less, renovating his house, declaring it was needless. On his bed were some drawers he consumed to terminate his life after butchering his wife and baby. The Gendarmerie Brigade in Sancho is investigating the act for in-depth and better comprehension as many attribute it to occultism. <laughs> A 
innocent as they report in there on that tragic incident in Sancho in the west region of the Republic of Cameroon. Inadequate or no electric energy supply remains a major problem, further complicating the already difficult and even precarious living conditions of Cameroonians from the major cities like Yaoundé and Douala into the hinterlands. This uh, problem is uh, adversely affecting life and, of course, uh, business activities and all other activities in the towns and villages and, of course, households. Immaculate Fokwe reports on the situation in Banga in the Mongo Division, littoral region of Cameroon. Inhabitants of Banga, a locality in the Mungo Division of the Litoral region of Cameroon, have been in the dark for over a month. Oh, I'm very sad because of the light issue, even though we are not comfortable, we are not comfortable for this our, our side because every time the light, we always go, we will go to, today here, yeah, they will say that light is gone the poor and so on, but even for the poor, the people that are working to see how they can do it, one or how they can try to help us so that we can be, we have tired to believe in darkness. This locality, which is blessed with abundant natural resources, is still suffering. The state of most of the poor in the area are deplorable with most of them now crisscrossing farms. When something like this, we cannot have, a poor cannot fall and will be, will be, oh, oh. Two weeks, one week before having light, and we do pay our businesses, our things are not going. Some of the things that are spoiling, like the fridge and the electrical thing. Also, every time we always see the pole, the electrical pole, and people will come, they will carry it and go right to Douala, leaving us here with this other one that are not fine. So, anytime when they put by this one, it will just fall. It will not even take, it will not, it will not even use it even like two months, three months. The situation has caused many of its inhabitants to rely on other sources of energy. We face plant difficulties here because I don't know. So that is the we are facing a lot of difficulties here. We have been without lights for over a month, yet we still receive exorbitant bills. For example, I came here to grind cassava, and the amount I'm being charged to pay is very high. It is because they are using a generator. The bad thing about it is that we are still going to be paying bills at the end of the month. Locals fear that if something is not done to address the situation, the level of crime wave in the area will increase and business activities will equally experience a drastic drop. And weeks after the promises made by the country's Minister of Territorial Administration at Tanganji Paul to victims of the recent violent protests in the locality of Sang Milima in the south region of Cameroon, many are still expecting aid from the Yaoundé administration in order to uh, revive their business activities, uh, notably to rebuild their shops destroyed during that protests orchestrated by the killing of a commercial motorbike rider in that locality. Hemin Iluga reports. The incidents are still fresh in the minds of Cameroonians on the societal turbulence recently recorded in Sang Milima this October 2019, which saw the immediate intervention of forces of law and other among administrative and local authorities. The incidents caused huge material damages with directly affected persons being traders whose boutiques and business operation sites were vandalized. One month after the incident and with some administrative promises made to the business operators, realities on the field as it now still remains questionable. Some shop owners are yet to resume business. Meanwhile, just a few are timidly picking up from your shattered operations. On ne va pas dire que tout va pour le mieux. Pourquoi? Parce que les promesses du gouvernement n'ont pas encore été tenues. We can't say all is working as expected because all the promises the government made has not been met. Meanwhile, we have to survive. We have anyway been relying on our partners. This business operator says 
the R resuming timidly and he sees the lack the means to resume properly. We are just managing to relaunch activities and without the promised government's aid, we are indebted as our partners have only been functioning with us on board. We are still waiting on the government's aid. The quest for support is inevitable. The traders won't forget the promises made by Minister Paul Tanganji. We would recall more than 50 shops were brought to floor level. While hoping to get the support promised by authorities, some victims of circumstances regret their experiences today caused by the October societal upheavals this year in San Melima. My kids are there at home. Every day we manage to eat. We can't imagine every day rise because we can't do otherwise. We hope for this aid. Even though business resumes timidly in San Melima and a secured atmosphere stabilized, the businessmen still hope on the promises made by the government that which assure them of financial aid to reboot their activities. They have gone for over seven months without salaries. The uh, councillors of the Kumba 2 subdivision in the crisis hit southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon. And this is one of the consequences of the three year long Anglophone uh, crisis that has crumbled the activities of uh, councils, notably taxis. Many of the councils in the two Anglophone regions of the country say they have not been able to collect a time for the past uh, close to three years as a result of the Anglophone crisis and they are now depending on state subvention to survive and because of the accumulation of months of unpaid salaries the councillors of the Kumba 2 subdivision walked out of the uh, council uh, session a council session recently in protest and calling on the mayor to do something to solve the situation we have details in this report compiled by for me, I'm strong, Sander. Shortly after the launch of deliberations, councillors of the Kumba 2 Council stage a walkout of the council session over the non-payment of their allowances for seven months. They accused the mayor of the council area, Mr. Fortier Martin, who on his part says the council does not have money as a result of the Anglophone crisis. Imagine that Faircom is supposed to give us taxes that they collect on behalf of the councils. Four quarters a year. And then we are now in November. Faircom has only paid two quarters. And then subdivisional council like us, we have nowhere to tend to. We are not collecting anywhere. How can we operate? And that is why I did mention that we are even owing salaries for seven months. It is not of my making. It is because the Kong has not played its own part. After discussions with the representative of the senior divisional officer for the Meme, councillors accepted to return to the council session to continue with the budgetary session characterized by accusations and counter accusations. I have gone through everything that concerns stress. When I was first elected, it was that 8 2 from the party. By the time that the 8 2 ended, I was elected regional chairman of the party for the Southwest. It was another story. People always look at me, they don't know that we got everything is possible. At the end of the day, councillors refused to vote the proposed budget, and the mayor says it is unfortunate, but a strong message to the government. A warning to the state. That every day I talk, every day they talk about decentralization, decentralization. They should work with action. You cannot implement it, the project, the projects of the southwest region organized their budgetary session in Kuma. In the course of the exercise, some courageous councillors challenged administrative officials of the locality to bring back peace to Mbonge subdivision so they can be able to effectively execute municipal projects. The sum of 980 million francs CFA was adopted for the Mbonge Council in 2020. And many other councils in several parts of the two Anglophone regions of the Republic of Cameroon are witnessing the same uh, situation. And the councillors have equally gone for several months without their allowances uh, being paid to them. And this is because of the deepening anglophone crisis and of course the Muyuka Council is also badly affected by the anglophone 
uh, crisis and the council is uh, struggling uh, to uh, catch up with its duties as a result of the anglophone crisis it's been very difficult for the councils in the two anglophone regions of the country because they have been unable to collect uh, taxes and of course to carry out other income generating activities in the different uh, municipalities and the councillors of the Muyuka Council have been uh, discussing all of these, notably during the uh, council sessions. There is just a report on the last council session in Muyuka. There is no area in the southwest region that has not been affected by the anglophone crisis. But the southwest population say there are some areas in this restive region that are epicenters emanating heat every time of the day and Moyoka subdivision stand tall in Fako division. This area, especially Ekuna, has seen all. Moyoka, before the crisis, was a must-go place, especially for agribusiness. <laughs> And the coming of men King Michael at the helm of the Moyoka Council brought Moyoka subdivision to its head is the construction of markets, roads and the electrification of Pundu Balong among others with other projects in the pipeline met Moyoka subdivision a magnet. Then the crisis came. And today, Moyoka subdivision is a shadow of its own former self. At a budgetary session for the 2020 budget of the Moyoka Council, Tambe Thomas Tabot, the divisional officer for Moyoka subdivision, warned these councillors not to divert their attention, but the Moyoka councillors insisted, flip back and open the page of the major national dialogue vis a vis Moyoka subdivision. How many Moyoka people were represented in Yaoundé? What have we done? What do we do to deserve that? We we'll sit and cross our hands. We want to become mayors. To men King Michael, Moyoka seemed to have been abandoned to lick its wounds. Reason why they must come together under one thinking cap as councillors to rescue their subdivision, especially now that the elections have been announced. It's like everybody in Moyoka wants to become the mayor. No, please. Let us put our heads together and find out what is for the interest of the population before our individual interests. With the 2020 budget for the Moyoka Council now adopted. Balance to the sum of 1 billion 43 million. We are envisioning a lot of uh, developmental projects leading to them that despite all what is going on, they should give the council that leeway to carry out this project for the development of Muyuka. Yes. Now in the sports, the indomitable lines of Cameroon have continued intensifying their training ahead of the encounter against uh, Rwanda this uh, weekend within the context of qualification for the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations to be hosted by President Paul B.S. Country. In their training session yesterday, several fans who turned out uh, to watch the players were not allowed to enter the annex of the Bepanda Omispo Stadium here in Cameroon's economic capital dweller. They went home disappointed, disappointed. Take a listen to one of them. It's our I'm really, really disappointed, honestly, because uh, it's our national team. So we came out to actually boost them up. But you guys will bear with me that uh, uh, Cape Verde is not really a small team. It has picked up with age. They are growing up, so you shouldn't expect them to do extraordinary things. It was a good game. It came out because we got the announcement that they will be in Douala. It's been over 11 years. They've not been in town. So they came in, and we too said we should come out and boost them up. But we are really, really disappointed because we came here from what we heard here that they have to call the governor to give order for us to get inside the, 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 the stadium. So we don't seem to understand who is doing what and at what time. I was in Bonaberry. So I left Bonaberry, I rushed over here before thinking of going back home. 
and the indomitable lions of Cameroon had another training station today and they are expected to leave the country later tonight and still in sports Cameroon's main Olympic team will not be present in Tokyo next year the under 23 lions miss out after losing to Egypt one goal to two in a, a final uh, group a uh, match at the under 23 uh, Tournament, and of course, we have details with Smanji and Gebre. One victory over Mali. So, ball in. Oh, what a chance there, but it's fallen to Evina. A defeat in the hands of host nation Egypt. Back ahead, and who else? But Mustafa Mohamed, blink and you'd miss it. And a draw against the Black Meteos of Ghana, earning them four points. This was the report card of the Under-23 team at this year's Under-23 African Nations Cup, ongoing in Egypt. The elimination of the boys of Coach Rigobert Song Bahanak, sports analysts have blamed it on the lack of their preparation and the non-availability of some key players. We've seen that the team is not yet ready to take part in some major events. It was very, very average outing out there in Egypt. The song we go bear or whoever will be there should maintain the same uh, boys that we have right now because it's been a, a mixture of uh, home-based players initially and at this stage where we went to the competition without uh, uh, those home-based players, the fault goes to the organizers of the domestic league. There is uh no cohesion in the team. The championship in Egypt doesn't fall during the FIFA calendar. Some of our best players, the likes of uh, Ignatius Ganako, who was with the senior Lions, uh, we have to blame ourselves because uh, uh, we didn't get the best. With the elimination of Cameroon, all eyes and attention is now tilted to Cameroon 2020, when the African Nations Championship for home base players will be organized from the 4th to the 25th of April. For a better performance, the sports analysts say... So many things should be organized in time, regroupment in time, so that we have so many friendly matches also, so that we have a good team to prepare before the 2020 uh, African Nations Championship to avoid the same embarrassment that we had this time around. The championship in Cameroon needs to start on time. Uh, the coaches need to be up to speed because we are still lacking technically. So I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, something good will come out of this same team because we just need to maintain this group of guys. And uh, before 2021, I bet you they'll be up to speed. The recent performance of the different teams in Cameroon and clubs have made many to believe Cameroon's football is weaknessing a slump that something needs to be done urgently. Back the fourth time, and Bezo from that right hand flag, better ball in that time. Cross. Spongy and Gabriel ending the first part of this newscast. Talking point is up next. Our guest today is Njang Denis, National President of the Popular Action Party. Mr. President, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening to all uh, viewers of uh, Equinox. Uh, my pleasure being here. During the Paris Peace Forum, the President of the Republic of Cameroon indicated that there was a possibility of absorbing the Anglophones into the majority uh, French-speaking part of the country, but he decided to offer a special status to the northwest and southwest regions of the country, and this has been interpreted uh, by some local newspapers as uh, a confession of uh, plans to assimilate the Anglophones. What do you think about this? Anyway, to me, it's not really a confession. It is the reality of um, God has his way to let uh, people confess. I'm happy that it took place in a summit where almost all uh, the international community, their eyes were on that summit. Had it been was in Cameroon, yeah, many, maybe many media houses would have uh, swallowed it up. So I am so happy that um, 
they, I can say a confession and the truth has been told that the world today is now aware that um, the Anglophones throughout for the past um, 56 years has been living in a dungeon under the regime of uh, uh, Mr. Bia and Mr. Aijo. I can call Mr. Bia because um, he has just let the world know it is really a, a shame. I don't know where those, some of those is elite, those is CBDM hand clappers who were the first to say there was no Anglophone problem. I think um, today I don't know where they are hiding themselves because um, their master openly told the world that um, the Anglophones have been vindicated and truly there's an Anglophone problem. And um, uh, 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 it is a uh, show to the world that um, truly um, it really goes as far as even him not able to even express himself in English. I think it's that the confession was just a, a little bit of the show because the whole world saw that a president who claims to be the president of a bilingual country can't even express himself in English. I mean, it goes he, a long he, way. He said some few words. You know, in it somewhere there, it he was in some few the few words that I got was that he told the, 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 the anchor of that panel that I am embarrassed with their question because I don't understand the language. So it is a way to tell the world that truly Anglophones are really, really suffering. And again, the world is, is, is a testimony to the fact that the genocide that Mr. B has declared, because it's a genocide, because he himself has proven to the world that all the uh, uh, um, um, names, name calling on the Anglophones, giving them all sorts of attributes, arresting, detaining illegally, and so forth, torture, the war he declared, truly, it is a war of occupation. Followers, and, uh, mm -hmm. followers and close aides of President Paul B have said it several times that the head of state never used those words, declaration of war, and not to talk about a genocide on the Anglophones. And they will say that uh, what the president meant in what he said was uh, an expression of uh, his willingness, his determination, his good faith to resolve the Anglophone crisis through a special status. From the words by Mr. Bia in the Paris summit, he let the world know that he is aware of the Anglophone problem. He even gave a little bit of history of the Anglophone problem, meaning that from the inception of this union, Mr. Bia's aim was to assimilate the Anglophones. And for him to come and say that he never declared a war, what was so difficult, the Anglophones, is not now that they started revendicating their own status. They are right. From the period where the name was changed from the federal structure to the unity state in 1972, from the unity state where he himself succeeded because he's the number one successionist, because he succeeded by changing the name from, I mean, unilaterally changed the name from the United Republic to the Republic, meaning that the confession that he said openly to the world is in line with all what Anglophones have been experiencing. So the day when Anglophones started revendicating, I can remember on the 22nd of September, 1st of October, meaning that Mr. Bia openly told the world that in the 1st of October, Anglophones had their independence because he made it openly that they have been trying to integrate the 20% to, uh, to the 80%, but unfortunately he has seen that it doesn't go. So I'm sure that Mr. Bia should truly be charged for war crimes against humanity because he knows the truth. They decided to take the war uh, 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 option, yes, and, that, yeah, and, and you see the disaster today. So when some people says he never declared war against the Anglophones, I don't know who today who is an Anglophone because as we speak today, we still have the, the uh, it's innocent citizens, civilians killed on daily basis in the English to English speaking region in the name of fighting whosoever. I don't know. If he declared a war because if he was declaring a war against a particular people today, who are those suffering the consequences? Schools are not ongoing. More than uh, 300 villages have been burned down. 50,000 refugees are found in Nigeria, and more than half a million displaced, internally displaced. Who are those suffering? The Anglophones. So all those aspects, the confession and the declaration in the Paris Peace uh, 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 Summit is an open uh, 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 way for the world to know that truly there was a genocide. Because he already, I'm not the one saying, he openly declared that I am guilty of what I am doing. Meaning that the Anglophones, what they, what they were, have been revendicating or are revendicating for the past years is the truth and nothing else but the truth. But, so but, if today he's bringing out a special status, it is, um, it is um, totally, totally um, um, disappointing to a, a, a president of such uh, status, a man of such age, to, after all these years of, uh, of killing, suffering, 
people have become homeless for you to go to the well and not even in Cameroon here and you pretend that uh, you want to give the Anglophones a special status. I think, um, as I said, he should be charged for war crimes against uh, humanity and he should be taken to the ICC. That's a very serious allegation and accusation against uh, the president uh, of the republic. I don't know. How, how can I don't you know back if up that I, war crimes, crimes yes, against humanity? Yes, it is a war crime against humanity because I am not the one that did the declaration and the confession. They asked him. I thought he would go to the Paris summit and keep on using his normal words that terrorists have been terrorizing the Anglophone speaking regions. He will call them secessionists and so forth. But today, I mean, on that day or today, the world is aware that all those attributes and names calling were just to a camouflage. To, uh, to continue his assimilation scheme. But I think um, there is a way that when God wants to vindicate people, he has his way to, to punish uh, your, your oppressor. I think it's a way of confession. But the confession cannot go like that because all the disaster that has been caused in the two English-speaking regions, who is responsible for it? It's not you. It's not me. It's not you, anybody. It's the person that or decided to use arms to resolve a problem that he himself has openly declared that he is aware of it and he is using it another means. This is what we have all been talking. There is an anglophone problem that he himself uh, acknowledged and we are all saying that let's sit on a dialogue table and see how we could come about this. So what is the uh, uh, essence of declaring a war and locking up people right up to today? I think um, I want to uh, uh, authoritatively uh, say today that I think there is no reason why Seseko and Co and the others who are still detained in line with the anglophone crisis should still be in prison because he had just made a confession that i am sorry we tried to integrate the people but there was no way so i think the only option now let me give that, you a that's an interpretation of what he said that is what he said and it, when he yeah, has that, made that's that, an interpretation Mr. Babila, i am not the one that made the confession if i came from my mouth he said it all of us saw it and we are only interpreting and uh, analyzing the statement the statement is clear I try to integrate the people. I have seen that it's no longer working. So I am sorry. I will give people a special status. Why are these people still locked up? Why was there need for any war declaration? So I think you and I, or maybe whosoever is watching at me that with me today that those who are locked up are accused of serious uh, crimes. Those who uh, are locked up are uh, accused uh, of uh, serious. And government is saying that they have to face the law. They cannot just be released like that. You cannot declare a war. Every every action that was taken by those who are presently in detention is as an action of. Well, I don't. To me, I'm not interested in the in the outcome of something. I'm looking about the cause. It's a, it's a result of a war declared. When you declare a war, what do you expect? Do you, you expect the op your opponent to sit and watch you slaughter uh, its people and, and 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 burning everything? No, there was a need for retaliation. So when I retaliate, you are not looking at what you have done. The government declared a war, and everything that is happening today is as a result of the war declaration. Now, so those, those, those you are saying that I think from the alone. onset from the anglophone problem, the anglophone problem did not start from Seseko. We should not be confused here. It did not start from Tassan, it did not start from whosoever. The anglophone problem started from 1972 right up to 1984, where he himself unilaterally changed the name of the country. Anglophones have been clamoring for, and up to date, till 1996, where he pretentiously pretend or pretentiously claim to uh, adopt what call is for so-called decentralization and things do not still move right up to date that God has blessed and uh, uh, given the Anglophones the opportunity that he himself went openly and confessed that I have seen that the integration of the 20% uh, in the 80 percent is not moving and i'm giving you is it is it imperative so, to release sisiku ayutabe and the other very uh, very that, is, that has been one part of the pap's declaration everybody arrested in line with the anglophone crisis should be released there is no need putting anybody in jail, in jail. nobody nobody whatsoever on the contrary the person that declared that war is the one responsible for whatsoever has been happening it's not me retaliating if I come to your house and I attack you, and I realize that there are some dangerous things in your house, like television, place, and all on, and I came and attack you without noticing that in the course of attacking you, those things can, that are fragile, they can get broken. And in the course of it, they get broken. I would attack you. You are only retaliating. So the people, they say, second all the light, are only re, they are only reacting in line with your action, the actions of Mr. Beer. So today, I don't see any reason why... Uh, 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 those people are still kept in Now, the head of so, state says measures have been taken 
for the special status to be conferred on the northwest and southwest regions of the country. Uh, this is coming more than a month after the major national dialogue where the participants agreed on this uh, special status. However, even though uh, many of the participants went home disappointed because they did not get the federal uh, system that they wanted, but uh, it was generally uh, accepted that a special status should be given to the northwest and the south regions and the president says now i'm going to implement this thing measures have been taken is that good news mr babila i don't think um i don't see that as a good news because i think in one of our declarations, the pap says the 1961 constitution should be revisited so what is the whole issue of the special status anglophones their revendication is that they want some some certain aspects of autonomy to be given back to the anglophones i think um um if at all I am not against any special status because, of course, we have countries where there has been like Quebec in uh, like Canada, in Quebec in Canada, we have Northern Ireland, we have Hong Kong in China, we have uh, Ca the Catalonians. It's not a bad thing, it's not a bad aspect. But to someone from someone who has never showed, no, no, who has never proven good faith to, to come out from his mouth, I doubt if at all of anything like that because, like, I followed the national dialogue in Benin, in Togo, not one a week that those issues were implemented, the resolution of the national law were implemented. I've, I've followed so many national dialogue where people have come together to discuss issues of their country, and within a space of two weeks, the implementations were already put in place. So if truly there was any good faith or from the resolution of any issue of that national dialogue, why take all this? Why why go back out of the country? Why is it not implemented? It the is, parliament, it, the it, parliament it, is ongoing now. I don't know of any bill that has been tabled that they should they should be implemented in the constitution that the national dialogue. So I think to me everything is a window dressing. It, it, I don't believe in it, anything. It, it's a good thing, the special status, that's what it says. I, I, but you are doubting because doubt, it's coming yes, from yes, President I am Paul not, yes, because I, I are you questioning the credibility and integrity of the head of state? Of course, that is why I am not the one questioning he himself has given a lot of doubts to Cameroonians to question his credibility. I am not the one because there are many announcements that he has made. There are many uh, um, promises that he has made. None has ever come to pass. So that is why to me, everything about the regime as of now, I am so skeptical because if there was any issue of national dialogue, what, 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 how, why, why, what till now? The parliament is ongoing. There is nothing. On the contrary, I am already hearing that there is a committee created by the prime minister to go in and sensitize people on sensitize i think if they want to implement they implement the aspect they vote it after voting it they put it into the law and they tell the people that that is the important uh, 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 national dialogue is it to not it. necessary to sensitize the people concerned before the implementation no the, i'm sure that any aspect of sensitization based on the present regime is just a waste of time they are just trying to kill time kill time kill time for time to go through because if they had any good faith i'm still repeating if there was any good faith of the decision the resolutions from the national dialogue there was no need for any issue of calling for an election now any calling for election now is of no use that's why we of the popular action party we realize that well, why waste all the taxpayers money just go like that without any concrete resolution i believe that the the, the national dialogue was not only targeted to the anglophone there were other aspects that were expecting the resolution to be implemented immediately because it was like an, an issue of an emergency an urgency that needed to be implemented uh, urgently but Look at it. Where we are today, we are hearing, rather hearing of the whole aspect of a, 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 an election that has been convened. Municipal and, so and legislative elections PAP, coming up in February 2020. Yes, that, yes, that's why I'm saying that. That's why the PAP from its inception, right from 2018, we said the country as of now is undergoing a refoundation. A reconstruction but if that election were not to be conducted if that election were to be postponed mm -hmm. the mayors the uh, MPs the senators would be occupying those positions illegally um, mr. Babila constitutions are made to better the life of the people the constitutions are drawn by the people in line with the realities of the people because are not made to satisfy an individual if it means postponing or saying that this constitution for now can be suspended for the sake of the interest of the entire nation. Let's see how we can reform. Because many of us, inside the PAP, we talk about the revision of the electoral code, which is too bad. There's no way any any political party going for any election as of now in order to legitimize the regime of BIA and the CPDM. There is no way the electoral commission, the body to manage the election, has we have 
totally been against it. We have talked about the, the, the instrumentation of the national dialogue. Nothing has been done, and people are going for elections. What's the important election? It's but the argument, the argument from the government is that the president of the republic is a man of the law, and he wants to respect the law. He wants those who are managing uh, public affairs of the nation to do so within the ambits of the law, and not out of their mandate, which would which will expire if the election is not. On the contrary to my best observation, the highest violator of the law is from the regime and the president himself. He has been violating the law. He only implements the law when he has to suit his rooms and practices. When he has to do with what the people want, he doesn't care about the law. When he has to do what he wants and what that will benefit his power and those of his, the regime in place, he implements the law. So I don't know when you are talking about what he respects the law or doesn't respect the law. What is more important? The law says this. The population says this is what we want. I think what we have to do is the population, when you are ruling people, you listen to what the people want. And at times you keep the law. What does the law want and what does the people want at this time? Because the law is, is, is dynamic. It, it fluctuates. It is elastic. At any moment, it can it can change based on the realities of of, 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 of how the, the events unfold. So at this particular juncture, everything as of now, the country is in total chaos. The economic socioeconomic situation in the country, post electoral aspects, the the the, 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 the electoral code, the, the election body, everything is in sham. I think what we need now is to sit and rethink and see how we can move the country ahead because as of now anything about election now i can authoritatively say here that it's just to legitimize mr bia and his cpdm to keep on staying in power jang din is national president of the popular action party thanks for coming thank you very much it's my pleasure thanks ladies and gentlemen stay with us